Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Daniel Mack. I'm the Associate Dean for Collection Strategies and Services. And welcome to our spring semester talk in our Future of the Research Library speaker series. Our speaker today is Mike Furlow. Mike is Executive Director of the Hadi Trust Digital Library, an organization that includes over 100 academic and research institutions working to transform scholarship and research in the 21st century. His research is focused on how libraries and universities develop organizational support for emerging scholarly communications practices. Getting the word out, Academic Libraries as Scholarly Publishers, which he co-edited with Maria Bunn, was published by the Association of College and Research Libraries in 2015. Mike is currently on the board of the Digital Preservation Network and is a member of the Future of the Print Record Working Group, sponsored by the Modern Language Association and American Historical Association. From 2011 to 2013, Mike served as faculty for the ARL DLF Duraspace eScience Institute. Uh, previously, he served as Associate Dean for Research and Scholarly Communications at Penn State University Libraries from 2006 to 2014, and in a variety of roles uh, supporting the development of digital scholarship services at the University of Virginia Library from 1998 to 2006. So please join me in welcoming Mike Furlow. So uh, first thing I want to do is just thank you all for coming out this morning, and I especially want to thank Dan and Gary for inviting me here. Uh, <coughs> Dan didn't mention this, but yes, we worked together for that period that I was at Penn State, and uh, really, we've been spending a fair amount of time catching up on old stories and talking about differences between institutions since uh, since we have both left. Um, I didn't tell Gary this, but we were talking about some space work, space renovations been going on. I, one of the things I don't miss at Penn State is talking about microphone cabinets, <laughs> <laughs> where, they, where, they would, where they would sit. So, um, so I'm going to talk with you all today about Hathi Trust. I, I, y'all are members of Hathi Trust. I imagine you know that, but I don't know how much you know about Hathi Trust. And I like to kind of come out to the libraries and talk about what we're doing and give you some background. And along this way, I really like to be sure that your questions are answered. So if at any point you have a question, um, raise your hand. I have a microphone. Phone, which I think you will need to speak into when we do that because this is being recorded. So um, let me just go ahead and jump in here and talk a little bit about what I think many people think of when they think of Hockey Trust. These are all little um, tweets that I have been collecting, clipping out over time for the last, this all came from last summer, fall. Uh, but it's kind of a good cross-section of the things that people have to say about Hockey Trust. And most people know Hockey Trust as a site online where you can go and you get you know, a fairly broad variety of digitized scholarly or cultural record books. You know, it's, it's a pretty broad range. Shakespeare riding a bicycle, uh, as an example, or the National Union Catalog is there. Um, uh, one of my favorite comments here is this one on the lower, uh, all the way on the lower, um, what is that right? Lower right, uh, where the paper was saved by death from early closing of the library. Uh, uh, and apparently the medievalist found what, uh, what she was looking for there. So, uh, so this is great, and I love seeing this. I have a special column up on my tweet deck that just kind of helps me see what people are saying about how to trust good and bad, and it's uh, humbling sometimes, and sometimes it's great. Uh, but what I really want to emphasize for you all is that, yeah, that's what we do, and that's what we're known for, and it's a core of what we do, but what we really are is, is much bigger than uh, a website, right? It's much bigger than something that looks kind of like JSTOR. Hockey Trust is really an organization of libraries, and research libraries in particular. And our mission is very much a library mission, and it's, it's ambitious, and it is to ensure that uh, the, the record of human scholarship is preserved in print and digital forms, right? And, and I'll talk a little bit about how we link those things together today. So at our core, we are a digital preservation archive, but by aggregating the number of materials that we've aggregated from the member libraries, and by those libraries working together and committing to building this infrastructure together, we can also start to develop programs that help to accomplish greater goods for the libraries. And I, I, I kind of always emphasize that Hathi Trust is about creating a broad public good that serves researchers and individuals worldwide, but also especially important is helping the libraries that are members of Hathi Trust serve their faculty, students, and staff in a much more cohesive and better way. 
So I'll talk about some of the programs we have. Um, and this is just a few comments. I started with tweets. These are comments from libraries themselves. And I think the core thing here is that there is uh, this middle quote that I always like to emphasize. This is kind of a mantra for me. It's like my job is to help make sure that the libraries can provide uh, higher quality services at scale at lower cost. Okay, so that's um, uh, a broad, a pretty broad challenge and one that we take very seriously, as, as you'll see. So a lot of people always ask, uh, Hati, what is that? Uh, how do you pronounce it? Is it Hati, like, uh, you know, like the chili peppers on Rate My Professor? And I always have to say, no, it is not. It is Hati. Uh, it uh, comes uh, originally from the, uh, from the uh, well, we pulled it from the Jungle Book. It doesn't come originally from there. So the name of Colonel Hati, the elephant, uh, big, uh, strong, uh, long-lasting, uh, secure, never forgets all of those nice attributes. Those are, that's really the origin of the name of Haunty Trust. It's not an acronym. I advise you not to try to create an acronym out of it because it will only lead to fit, you know, crying and you know, bizarre too. So what I will do today is just walk through a little bit more about the organization. I'll talk then about the collection. People are often wondering what all is in the collection. I can only see some of it, so what's the story? I'll talk about our access services and then some of the strategic initiatives, and I'll, we'll have time for questions uh, as we go. So first, um, these are the other members of Hati Trust. Uh, you, you all are on here. Uh, I made it easy for you to see because it's just about impossible to read this uh, from wherever you're sitting. Uh, even on my screen, it's pretty difficult. So we have about 114 members. The newest member that we just added uh, yesterday is uh, Williams College. Again, all the way down to the lower right. And Wesleyan actually just a few weeks before that as well. So it's a pretty broad range of institutions. Uh, not just the schools of the CIC, which were, uh, along with California, the founding institutions of Hockey Trust, but increasingly smaller colleges and liberal arts colleges in particular have been joining. Uh, so you see Wesleyan, Williams, Smith, uh, uh, Amherst, not Amherst, but uh, Allegheny, uh, and, and a, a pretty broad, a broad range here. So your ARLs and your non-ARLs uh, are both represented. We're mostly United States members at this point, mostly North American libraries. Uh, there are three members not from North America, and they are in uh, Madrid, in Beirut, the American University of Beirut, and Queensland uh, University in Australia. And then we have four Canadian members, McGill, <coughs> University of British Columbia, University of Alberta, and University of Calgary. And there's a couple of others up there we've been talking about joining as well. And as you go through, as I go through this, you'll see, you know, we began as an organization in the United States, so a lot of our work is based on United States copyright law. And, uh, and sometimes that has some, and there's also, you know, because we are so big in the U.S., there's, there's a little bit of an uphill outside the U.S. to understand how this might fit in, say, the U.K. or in Germany or something like that. So we're still pretty heavily U.S. Uh, I will, let me just tell you a few things about what members do, okay? And I'll talk about some specific uh, things you can do with Hunting Trust as members. But uh, we always have an annual meeting of the membership. It's never as big as I would like it to be. I'd like it to have, I'd like it to be, maybe someday we'll have it so that we can have many more people attending. But right now it's more framed as a business meeting. Uh, we have usually about 100 people, 110. Uh, the annual member meeting this year will be in November. We have started doing it at the Big Ten Center in Chicago, which is the house that the Big Ten Network built. Uh, it's like a beautiful conference center built with football money. Uh, the members also have a number of opportunities to participate in governance. Uh, that includes an annual vote on the budget. Uh, not a vote on your fee, but a vote on the overall budget, just approval of the budget by the membership, as well as annual votes on the Board of Governors. And occasionally, we need to change something with the bylaws, and that goes up for a vote as well. Uh, it says here required, but it's really kind of a nice, um, it's a nice requirement, right? We ask you nicely if you would submit your print holdings to us every year. And the, one of the reasons we do that is that is uh, how we know what is in your collection, how it overlaps with Haunting Trust digital collection, and then how we can provide certain services based on that overlap. It's also the basis of our fees, and it'll be important as we go through some new programs like Shared Print. There are a number of ways for you to take advantage of the services locally. I'll tell you more about that. One critical one, though, one critical thing is the requirement for shibboleth, which I think has been no problem here. Uh, libraries can deposit content, they can participate in working groups, and they can participate in these other initiatives, but it's, uh, it's really a fairly low overhead kind of set of requirements, even though we hope and we try to make it easy for everybody to participate. Uh, whoops, let's go back here. There we go. Uh, so a lot of people are confused about how we're organized. So um, I am an employee of the University of Michigan. 
right? I actually work in the University of Michigan. I have a library, an office in the library. Uh, and, uh, but Hathi Trust is organized as a service that the University of Michigan operates on behalf of its members. Okay, so that's how come I'm there. It's how come a lot of the staff are at Michigan. And it's where the uh, core preservation access repository and the administration finance, all of that is based. But we do involve other members in the operations. So Indiana University, when your former dean, Pat Steele, uh, was in Indiana, she helped get Hathi Trust started with Michigan by, ho by agreeing to host a mirror site for, for Hathi Trust. Indiana is also the host of a research center along with Illinois, which I will talk about shortly. And then we have metadata management services operated by the California Digital Library. And there will be more services we need to stand up in the next few years, and there'll be other opportunities for libraries to, if it makes sense for them, contribute in, in operating those. So I said I'm an employee of Michigan, uh, but I actually am really accountable to a 12-person board of governors. Uh, that 12-person board of governors I meet with four times a year. It includes elected representatives as well as appointed. There is a committee called the Program Steering Committee, which is really a group I work with every other week to kind of shape strategies and look at future directions and services. And then we have a, a number of different uh, working groups and committees, because uh, we're a library kind of thing, so of course we have working groups and committees. Uh, and here's a current list of them. I won't go through every one of these, but I just want to mention one thing in particular, the user support working group I have starred here. Uh, Dan Mack has been a part of that working group for the past uh, year, year and a half, two years. And uh, that working group is really critical because it is, it's like virtual reference. It is the front door for users, members, uh, individuals worldwide, potential members to interact with us. They write to an email address or click a feedback link. And Dan and others respond to questions, triage, and, or pass them along to staff. Uh, and it's, it's so important because, and it's, for me, it's a really great example of how the members really value Hathi Trust and are willing to contribute time and effort towards its, its uh, operation. So uh, a pretty broad range of things there. I'm happy to take questions about these later, but in the interest of time, I won't go into the charges and membership of every one of these. Instead, I'll talk with you a little bit about the collection and what we have in the, in the, in the collection today. Uh, these numbers are accurate as of last night, um, and I doubt seriously they've changed that much overnight. So uh, we now have 14 million total items. That is actually 14 million volumes. So we generally come <coughs> by books or volumes digitized and, and have, which have a record of the trust. That equates to about 7 million book titles, monograph titles. That's not deduplicated. So uh, if you go through, you'll probably find um, you know, two instances, two records for an issue, an episode, an episode, an edition of Huck Finn uh, that is possibly the same thing, but just got cataloged a little bit differently at one time. Over 370,000 serial titles, that's a mix of federal documents, uh, scholarly and public interest, general interest periodicals. Uh, over 700,000 federal documents from the U.S. government, and one of the things I'm especially proud of is here is that over five and a half million volumes in the Hathi Trust collection are in full view, meaning that they are either in the public domain or licensed in such a way that we can open them to readers worldwide. And that's a really fantastic, a fantastic thing. Uh, most everything you'll find in the collection has been digitized uh, from a book. It is a book that has been digitized and is represented as such. Uh, and the bulk of it is what you're going to find in research library collections in North America. So it's um, larger than most and its collection size larger than most any single uh, research library, but it has a pretty good, when people ask me what's in it, I often say go browse the stacks, uh, because that'll give you some, some sense of the material that's there. So I mentioned that we have mostly digitized published items. Uh, they tend to look like this. Uh, some of them are not this uh, black and white, but most of what we have has been the result of mass digitization programs over the last 10, 12 years. In fact, Hathi Trust got started after the Google Book Project began, and the CIC schools, along with California, were, were talking about how can we ensure that we will live up to our commitment as cultural memory organizations? How can we ensure that the stuff we're helping get digitized and accessible will be preserved and stewarded into future generations? Uh, and so everybody had contracts with Google that allowed them to take content back, so Hathi Trust is essentially an aggregation of that material. Right, so of over 90%, maybe 95% of our collection comes from Google uh, and uh, is available, uh, as I said, some of it is available for, for full view here. Uh, however, we do have some cases where we've done some prototypes and experimental projects. So this is 
uh, an example of an Islamic manuscript from the University of Michigan Special Collections. Uh, this was digitized as part of a grant to catalog hidden collections, and then Michigan digitized this as well. So there's actually a fairly rich, detailed cataloging record behind this, uh, behind this, much richer than you would see for your average book uh, that you find in WorldCat, for example. Uh, and so we're, even though most of it's published, we're certainly capable of taking other kinds of bound book-like material. We're probably going to be focused heavily, continued on text and text-like materials for the foreseeable future, because that's where we have strength, uh, it's what we're, we're optimized for, and where I think we can make the biggest difference. The contributors to the collection are uh, pretty various here, and most of them are members, but I want to just you know, call out that there are a few folks, a few libraries, a few organizations that have contributed content to Hati that are not members. And we don't do that very often, but we do it when we believe we can do so at no or very, really marginal cost, as we're not passing a whole big expense back to the membership for books that, um, that they did not digitize or ask to be submitted. So an example here is uh, KO University. It's in the first column. Uh, they had a Google digitizing project. They did a lot of work to identify which materials uh, they could open up under Japanese <coughs> law. Right, which ones were no longer in copyright. Japanese public uh, copyright law is pretty extensive. Uh, so we have about 80, 90,000 volumes in Japanese from Keio University. Very simple for us to add uh, once we work through the details there. So I get a, a good mix. Maryland has been adding materials as well, so I thank you for that. Uh, we, I had a conversation with some of your folks a few weeks ago about uh, uh, Yiddish and uh, Hebrew materials in the collection in particular. This chart is um, a little bit difficult to read from where you're sitting, I'm betting, but uh, if you can't tell, there most of the bars are dark blue at the bottom, and a few of them are orange and whole. Uh, from about the third column, fourth column over, this that is, uh, that is this, trying to show you titles in Hockey Trust by date of publication, by decade of publication. So the first three columns are like some aggregations from pre-1900. Everything else is 20th century. And so you can see in this chart very clearly the explosion of research publications in the second half of the 20th century. After the Second World War, when uh, research funding was flowing into US universities in particular, scholarly publishing was expanding, <coughs> libraries, collections, budgets were growing, and many more materials were suddenly available. And you find these materials highly, uh, widely duplicated in research libraries. And a lot of what we have is from that period. Unfortunately, only a small portion of that period is open, and most of what is open from the second half of the 20th century is most likely federal documents. Um, so this is just giving you a quick snapshot of when stuff was published, when stuff in Trust was published, and what of it is open. This is a more fine-grained view of the uh, of material that is open and not open in Trust. So these numbers actually, I looked, when I looked yesterday, I needed to update this chart and I couldn't get the numbers exactly, but it looks like we're actually closer to 40% fully open and 60% fully closed or not in full view right now. And the proportions are about right. Roughly 5% of the collection is a US federal document which is not protected by copyright, so we opened that. Some material is open by, in public domain worldwide, meaning anyone created anywhere. Some only in the US, meaning if you're in Canada, I'm sorry. Uh, if you cross the border, I can show it to you, but I can't show it to you while you're in Canada. Uh, and then uh, a very small percentage here you see is, is licensed by, with the Creative Commons or other open access license. And that's less than a quarter of a percent, but given that we have 14 million volumes, that's actually a substantial number of materials that have been opened by rights holders who have written to us and have said, I see you've got my book, I would like to make it open. <coughs> right? And, and uh, some of these are university publications, some of them are authors, who have said, you know, I'm so pleased to have it and make it available to people. Uh, so we have about 25 different, 25,000 different rights holders that we've worked with to open up titles in Hathi Trust. And then uh, one more uh, pretty picture here, uh, and then I promise you I won't bore you with pretty pictures anymore. Just be text from here on out. Uh, uh, the pie chart here shows roughly the language distribution in Hathi Trust uh, materials. Roughly half is in English. And the top 10 languages have remained pretty consistent, German, French, Spanish, Russian, Chinese, Japanese, Italian, Arabic, and Latin. Uh, and if you look at the full view materials, English is a larger percentage of that. But, uh, but these numbers remain fairly consistent through all. This always surprises people unless you work in a library, 
right? Unless you work in a library and you know how much foreign language material libraries acquire. Oh, one more pretty picture, here you go. So um, I include this chart here to give you a sense of what in Hathi Trust overlaps with the University of Maryland's collection. Okay, and I'll try to decipher this chart for you. Remember earlier I said we ask for holdings information every year. We ask everybody to say, send us a list of your, well not a list, but send us a list of your OCLC numbers and you know the condition, and then we match those up with the collection. And that gives us a chance to do this overlap analysis. So what this is showing, I should, I, actually I misspoke a second ago, what this is actually showing is the, the graphic is showing the, the, the rate of overlap between the University of Maryland physical collection and other Hathi Trust members' physical collections. Okay, so the way to interpret this is somewhere in the middle there, there's a 50, and uh, the, the bar goes up to around 23,000 uh, items. So about 23,000 titles then are, um, are duplicated by 50 other libraries in Hathi Trust. Does that make sense? Uh, on the very far end, you've got about a very small number of items that are duplicated 100 times within the Hathi Trust membership. So that gives us a sense of what's on the shelves and how much potential there is to look at collective collection management in the membership. Uh, the, the, what I gleaned from looking at this month's holdings report is that now based on the current, current membership, excuse me, current collection, uh, just above 34% of your collection overlaps with Antitrust. Okay, so two different, two different graphics here, two different sets of big figures. The graphic kind of showing you how does your collection uh, compare with the rest of the Hathi Trust membership, and then uh, a smaller portion of it is duplicated in Hathi Trust itself. And that 34%, that's about average within ARL libraries. Okay, so this is the chart I sometimes title, there is no accounting for taste, or you never know what people are gonna find interesting. So um, this is just a, looking back at the 2015, what did people use in Hathi Trust? What were the most accessed items? And I can, one thing I can tell you is that there are an awful lot of genealogists out there uh, because those five volumes of the roster of Confederate soldiers are heavily used. If I actually, uh, if I showed you the original graph, uh, data here, you would see that those five volumes independently make up like the top 10, half of the top 10. Uh, so I just lumped them all up as one. Uh, but the second item there is a, a classic uh, geometry mathematics textbook in its first edition, the co uh, published in 1934, for which the copyright was not renewed. Uh, Quicksand is a novel written during the Harlem Renaissance by a woman named Nella Larson, uh, kind of forgotten for about 40 years until the 80s when, uh, when it was rediscovered, republished by Rutgers University Press. Uh, and then it sort of ended up, in, ended up in Penguin Classics, ended up on AP English class, uh, a reading list. So uh, it happens to have gone out of copyright. So we have a public access copy in Hockey Trust, and there are an awful lot of people who read it online, uh, uh, either instead of or in addition to the physical copy they're reading in their class. And then the uh, other one I'll call attention to here is Gotti's Magazine, volume 40, 41. Nothing particularly special about that, other than it is linked to a teaching guide uh, published by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, giving teachers uh, lessons on how to use original 19th century materials in the classroom. So the assignment is, you know, go to, go to this uh, publication and learn what you can from 19th century life, about 19th century life from it. So again, a pretty wide range. Um, I have no idea what's going on with the consumption of the lungs and kindred diseases treated and cured by kerosene, which is a perennial favorite, uh, unless, unless that's as, um, you know, some folks are preparing for the apocalypse and they have a stockpile of kerosene and they want to know what they're going to do with it. They can't burn it. So, um, all right. So let me talk about access to all of that stuff. That's a pretty huge amount of stuff. And, but it's really, and, and I emphasize that we are a preservation service, but it's really no good that for us to be doing preservation unless we are also providing access. Right? I mean, access is the reason you preserve. And yes, you might make dark copies of it somewhere, right? But you also want to make sure those dark copies are there while there's also a service, a distribution copy available somewhere else. You know, this is the classic strategy we use with microfilm. And it's the strategy we use with Hathi Trust. We have tape backups that are stored in secret locations, uh, as well as the access copies that are online. So uh, we are a core preservation service. We were audited by the CRL, Center for Research Libraries, a few years ago, and are uh, identified as a trusted repository. 
We're also a replicating node uh, within the digital preservation network, and I won't go into details on that here unless you want to ask questions about it later. But it just means we're one of five nodes in the United States that are agreeing to serve as a kind of major preservation backbone uh, for, for the higher, higher education. But the core of what we do for most people is access and discovery. So uh, we enable discovery on everything in the collection, full view or closed view, right? So even in copyright materials, you know, you can find them in the catalog. You can also do full text search, okay? So you can do full text search across the whole collection in copyright materials that are not open will be made visible to you. You can search within those books, but you cannot read those books, okay? We, are, we do not have licenses from every publisher to open that material. Uh, the, we have an API which allows libraries to pull the bibliographic data, the mark records, into their local catalog for discovery. And you can screen that in a number of ways so that it is only, uh, only the material that's in full view, or maybe it's only the material that is in a particular, um, you know, published in a particular date range. I mean, it's, it's pretty open what you, can, what you can do with that. And there are also, uh, I'll show you in a second, some examples where we've worked with uh, discovery vendors to ensure that the index is available in their services as well. And then I say access and use varies because it varies with the status of the work in copyright, or rather the work's copyright status. So as I just said, full text search is available to everywhere, to everybody. Um, we also have a research center that allows text and data mining, which I'll talk in more detail about later. Uh, anybody can take advantage of that as well. Uh, we, I've said before, we give full access or full viewing access to, uh, to public domain and open access works worldwide. But if you are a member, then you can download the item, right? Otherwise, you have to do it a page at a time. So that's a privilege we, allo we allocate to members there. Everybody can read, but only members can download. There are also, I mentioned one API a second ago, there are a few others that allow for uh, some special uses of the collection uh, and other aggregations. We also have a collection builder tool, which basically allows you to build sets uh, that people can save and share publicly or retain for later use. And then the last item I'll talk about here is what we can do within copyright materials in the US uh, and in some uh, non-US uh, locations as well. The one that I talk about the most and that I think is most um, most important to the broadest range of libraries is access for users with print disabilities. So we have the service enabled so that uh, working through an individual service provider on the campus, maybe it's the Office of Disability Services, maybe it's an individual in the library, students who are blind or otherwise print disabled can access the, the in copyright items in HathiTrust. And that's a, that's a pretty significant thing because there's such a small portion of materials that have been published in the US and even are published right now that are accessible to users who are blind or otherwise visually impaired. And uh, you know, if you know anything about these services on campuses, they're scrambling all the time to kind of catch up, get things digitized, or find a digital version of a textbook and get it prepared for the student. Uh, we don't have a lot of textbooks in Hati, but it's essentially the research library collection becomes available and, you know, to the student here in a way that not, not previously done. And we're looking for other ways we can expand upon that service so that it others can take a broader, broader um, use of it. The second use that we can provide is preservation replacement, that is digital access to items that you have had in your collection but which have otherwise been lost, gone missing, they're damaged, they can't be used. This is kind of like the Brittle Books uh, uh, project, right? So uh, we, we have a process in place for that. I've been talking with the conditions that must be satisfied there are the, the item has to be, uh, has to have been in your collection and has to have been lost or, or damaged and it has to no longer be available on the market, right? So you can't buy a copy and you don't have your copy anymore. That's when we can provide access. Um, I emphasize those, th those important distinctions because it's embedded in US copyright law and we, we, we rely on that pretty heavily. Uh, so I've been talking with uh, some folks here about how to do that here at Maryland. We had a little snafu with calendar in last week, which um, one of our former board members had access to our phone conference calendar and canceled a whole bunch of meetings for a week. So it's was, it was quite fascinating to see what you can do. <laughs> I know you all just moved over to Google Apps, so I'll just warn you, don't let everybody have access to the shared calendar. Just <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so I said a second ago that uh, you can pull catalog records into your local catalog. This is an example from uh, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, where Quicksand, that novel I mentioned a few minutes ago, Quicksand is here found in the library catalog. Uh, get it online, 
click, it'll take you to Hathi Trust. Uh, this is an example of the same item being found within uh, the Summon Discovery Service as enabled in Penn State. Uh, the, so the full text is searchable, uh, and Summon has made that, you know, you can turn, the, it's a feed you can turn on and off. So it's in most of the, the big four, uh, which I will forget the names of, but um, Primo, um, uh, Summon, um, the one by EBSCO, uh, the one by Rollcat. <laughs> so uh, they, they keep changing the names, and I think they're all owned by one company <coughs> So, uh, uh, so people always ask too, how do people find HathiTrust? And I can tell you that about half of the people who use HathiTrust, or at least half of the view accesses, half the sessions, come from people who just go directly to HathiTrust and go to do a search, or they're going directly to an item. But of the remainder, most people find us through Google, which, hey, big shock on that. The big shock, though, after Google is that this site called Online Books at UPenn, uh, there's a librarian at Pennsylvania named John Mark Ockerbloom who maintains a list of, of open access electronic books online. And he maintains that meticulously, and people go to Hathi Trust from that site all the time. So uh, if you know John, thank him for me. Uh, WorldCat's also a big source. Uh, DPLA is the next largest. We are a content hub for DPLA. So anything that is in Hathi Trust that's full view is discoverable in Digital Public Library of America. But what's notable here is that after that, you start to see certain library catalogs or discovery services come into play in driving traffic to us. So Michigan's, Columbia's, Penn State's, Illinois's, Berkeley's, and the Library of Congress are all, uh, you know, not, you know, the percentage is small, but that's a significant number of sessions for us overall. Then, uh, these are four slide title, title slides I grabbed from our member meeting. I mentioned earlier, last, uh, that last December, earlier we have a meeting in this, this coming fall, we had our last member meeting in December, and we had a, a cool little session there where various members came up, did a quick lightning talk on a way, a thing that they're doing on their campus that is taking advantage of Hathi Trust. And I shared these examples here uh, just to kind of um, let, give, you a, give you a sense of what some of these are. I won't go into all of the details, uh, but I can tell you, for example, that University of Florida has found a way in their catalog to signal to that there are items that might be available for users who are blind or print disabled uh, in their catalog. So they've got those records hooked up in such a way. Um, University of California, San Diego, they have had, uh, they have the, you know, the Scripps uh, Oceanographic Institute is there. They had to close that library a few years ago physically, and they prioritized digitization of materials from that, and have used the Hathi Trust Collection Builder to essentially recreate the Scripps library, or at least much of it, online, and create a little custom interface to it from their side. So they've been able to recreate a kind of a virtual, a virtual library from their collection uh, using that. Um, NYPL stole our rights codes, uh, that's actually not quite right, but they, they modeled a, a, a process of us identifying the rights for works in their collection based on the Hathi Trust rights process as well. So a pretty wide range of things that you can do, and uh, I'm always looking for more examples of this, and you know, even if it's just including it in the catalog, that's great, you know, because I think the most important thing is enabling access. All right. I have been talking rather fast, as I tend to do, uh, and I only have a few more minutes, uh, and a few more minutes where I'm going to keep talking fast at you, but I want to move from collections and access to talking about some current initiatives that we have underway. Uh, I think we have many more than these, but these are the biggest ones that are uh, probably most reliant on the cooperative itself, by which I mean these are the things that really will do or will rely on member libraries taking an active part in, in the process. So I'll talk about how we do copyright review, uh, share print management, the research center, and federal documents. So first, copyright review. Uh, this has been a project underway for about eight years. Uh, started with grants to the University of Michigan uh, from IMLS, the Institute for Museum and Library Studies. Uh, we are now taking responsibility for project management into Hathi Trust for this. Uh, and Maryland's been a contributor to this project, and it's essentially a very large, widely distributed uh, system of reviewers investigating the copyright status of works in Hathi Trust. So for works that were published in the United States, uh, there's a process where people go and check the formalities. Did it appear with a copyright notice? Was it renewed? Uh, was, you know, were other formalities followed? 
for materials published in the United Kingdom or Canada or Australia, the, the key deciding factor is whether or not the author died over a certain number of years ago, right? Canada, Australia, 50, and the UK, 70. So if the, researcher, if, the, if the researchers who are looking into copyright status can determine this is the case, then we will open the work, right? But if we can't figure it out, it's complicated, if it doesn't look like, we, you know, we'll, we'll move on, we'll go on to another one. We've had, we've had enormous success with this, uh, doing this kind of distributed review with over, folks from over 20 libraries <coughs> taking part in it, and I can't even tell you how many different individuals that is. Uh, but they've reviewed close to, or just over 600,000 items in the last eight years, and a little more than half uh, are open. That seems to be a pretty consistent number. So a uh, huge effort, and I thank everybody, anybody who's ever, ever participated in this, because it, it makes a huge difference. <coughs> Federal documents is a little bit different. This is something that we're, we're trying, trying to centralize a little bit differently, but I think is of interest to many libraries. Most of the US libraries are the Federal Document Depository, Federal Depository Libraries in some way, selective or regional. So uh, when we all got started with Google Books and, uh, and Hathi Trust got started, the CIC schools in California both said, we got a whole big pile of government documents in our collections that are not easily found, they're not discoverable, uh, they're, um, they're not accessed very much, they're taking up more space for the level of access that they get. Can we do something to digitize these items? If we digitize these items, can that promote more use? and can it help us with, with the management of these collections? So the, the, the project is really just this, expand and enhance access to federal documents in Hathi Trust, which uh, can be boiled down to figuring out what exists, right, using both the GPO catalog and other sources, what's the, um, what is the, can we come up with a comprehensive list of all federal documents in our libraries? Um, I realize that is a, you know, receiving goal and ever advancing horizon, right? You're never gonna figure out what everything is, but you're gonna you know, make a big step. And then use that as a way to determine what needs to be scanned next, right? So the big push uh, in the second half of this year is gonna be starting to generate pick lists or want lists and look for opportunities to digitize from collections. And this is where our holdings information comes in really importantly, right? Because we then know who has what. So we'll be, we'll, you'll hear more about this uh, in, the, in the coming months. Uh, this project's been going on for a while. The registry's been going on for a while, in about three years, with um, uh, someone named Valerie Glenn, who some of you may know uh, as our metadata analyst for the registry, and Heather Christensen uh, from California Digital Library will be joining us at the end of May to uh, lead this project going forward. <laughs> Another big initiative, uh, really ambitious, that I've begun to see as maybe one of the most important things we're doing is developing a shared print monograph archive. And this is one that you know, people say, what are you doing with print? You're not a print library, you're a digital library. So the, coming back to what I said about federal documents from the very beginning, the principle was, you know, we've got a bunch of stuff, we all have a lot of duplication, if we're working together, we might be able to find ways of uh, managing the collections more effectively. Uh, so I look at this as a, in a different way, right? We talk, you know, one principle here is how can we find ways for the libraries to more efficiently manage highly duplicated materials, right? So if you're taking, I don't know if you're taking part in the CIC serials uh, project, but you're familiar with this where serials are being consolidated at Indiana, uh, you're, you're probably withdrawn some back files based on what you have access to from certain license, licenses. Uh, I see this in a, in a much different way when it comes to monographs, and that is how can we be sure we know what is being preserved <coughs> in print? And that's a bit, very different question from knowing what's in the catalog, right? Because you can know that a library catalog says this item's on the shelf, but it may not be on the shelf. Uh, you can know that they have it, but you don't know for sure that they're going to retain it. And that's true even now for the, quote, libraries of record, right? The ones that we have all historically relied upon to collect large numbers and keep, like <coughs> Harvard and Yale and so forth. And I'm not saying they're, you know, backing up the truck. I'm just saying that they, even they are talking publicly about how they cannot continue to expand infinitely, right? So our project here is to establish a, a distributed monograph archive where every, every monograph in Hathi Trust has at least one library that is committing to retain the item going forward. Okay, so we want more than one, but one, we'll, we'll take one to start with. 
Uh, we're not going about this first trying to figure out, okay, what's most at risk or uh, how many copies or anything like that. We're just focused first on let's get as many as we can and see what we find out. So the goal is at least initially see if we can get half of the collection committed in the first couple of years. Uh, do some data analysis, see what we need to do there. Uh, the materials do need to be accessible, so we're not asking anyone to put these in dark storage. Right? They, they will be circulated in some way. Uh, the commitments need to be disclosed, so that means that they will be findable in WorldCat or maybe in some other knowledge bases. And this is where I think where it becomes critical, because then libraries have actionable information. Right? Then you know who is committing to retain an item. Then you can say, okay, we're going to retain it too, or this one looks like it's probably covered and we don't need to do it. Okay. So I, I really see this, uh, Dan mentioned I'm on something called the Future of Print Working Group. Uh, which sounds you know, like we're figuring out whether or not paper is going to be a viable format going forward. That's not it. Paper is going to be a viable format for a very long time. It's really about how do we ensure that our legacy as librarians can be sustained into future generations in an effective way. <laughs> research. Uh, there's all kinds of research that you can do with Hantu Trust, but the one I'll talk about here is this um, infamous phrase, non-consumptive research which does not mean that you do research without tuberculosis, uh, for those of you who are familiar with 19th century operas. Um, this is not the La Boheme Research Center. Uh, instead, this is about how you do computational analysis on the Hattie Trust collection. So analysis that does not uh, require <coughs> reading, right? It's uh, the, or the use phrase that's been widely used, distant reading. So text and data mining. Uh, and it's important that we frame this as non-consumptive because the goal here is to do this not only with materials that are open, but the materials that are in copyright, right? Those materials that are not in full view, those are materials we want to be able to provide text and data mining services for as well. So that's the key here. And uh, Indiana University and Illinois, University of Illinois, have both stood up, are jointly hosting this. They, they have different uh, parts of the, of, the, of, the, of the picture here. Indiana is very heavy on infrastructure and security. Illinois is very heavy on methods and, and uh, practice uh, and metadata. So they've been offering a few different services and developing a few of these going forward. I'll show a couple of these in just a second. I'll mention that you can, uh, you can either use the services that they have available online, or at least for the public domain material, uh, we are able to distribute those data sets to individual researchers who want to do some work on their own in their own environment. The URLs, by the way, are there for future reference. I'll make sure these slides are available for after the fact. <laughs> so one service the Research Center provides is the portal. Uh, this is available at the URL you see here. Uh, Shark Secure Hathi Trust Analytics Research Commons. Um, uh, forewarning, that's going to change just to analytics.hathitrust.org soon. So, um, but for now, use Shark. This is a site where uh, individuals have the ability to go <coughs> in and create subsets. Right. So if you want to create a subset of materials for future analysis, you can go in and use their work set builder here to do so. Okay. And then there are a few tools, I shouldn't say a few, there's actually a good number of tools that are there that have been contributed by individuals or other projects that have, uh, that have done, focused on text mining tools in the past. So you can apply one of those to it, it that might do things like tell you what are likely OCR errors in the text. Uh, it might uh, help you pull out dates or proper names in the text. There's a pretty wide range of, of, of very simple tools uh, there at that site. <coughs> now the goal we have for the Research Center is to improve and expand the infrastructure available uh, through the Research Center over time by working with researchers to do it. Another goal we have is that we in, uh, not only enable researchers to do their work, but also benefit from that and can improve the collection in some ways going forward. So one thing that we have, uh, the Research Center has done in the past year is promote a project uh, or put forward something called the Advanced Collaborative Support Program. And this is essentially a, a program that has allowed for individual teams or researchers to submit a proposal to the Research Center and uh, they select down to a manageable number of proposals that they can then support more extensively over a period of time. So the idea here is that this is a prototyping project or a pilot project. Uh, the Research Center then will allocate some percentage of staff time to consult with the team or the researcher on the method, on the tool, on defining the subset, on defining the process. Uh, they started it both to kind of 
promote the service of the center, but also to identify what's going on out there. Right? So who's doing something interesting? What can we learn from it? And are there opportunities for us to reincorporate uh, that back into the Hot to Trust services in some way? So some examples we might see at some point in the future is metadata enhancement and cleanup. Uh, Trevor is sitting in the back of the room. He was part of a grant that came to the Research Center uh, 2013-14 <coughs> from the Mellon Foundation that was looking at how you could more, um, uh, through less human intervention, uh, create work sets uh, for further analysis. And Trevor's project was to look at how metadata could be corrected at scale using crowdsourcing uh, and reliance on authority <coughs> files and uh, learned an awful lot from that. So these are just two other example projects that are underway right now or have been underway under the first uh, Advanced Collaborative Support Program. Um, I want to go back just a little <coughs> bit here because uh, next to the last URL, that program has announced another call and it's open until the early part of May for proposals. All right, let me wrap up here. I've talked about a lot, so what are we doing this year? Um, you know, I first, I'll be perfectly honest with you, I first drafted this slide in January, and I'm like, geez, it's April, so where are we on these things? Um, so this is our agenda for the year, and actually most of this is, is, is not a problem at all. We have uh, the SharePoint Monographs program is really getting launched. We've done a lot of planning for it. It's getting launched starting on May 2nd when Lizanne Payne will join Hockey Trust to lead that program as the program officer. I've mentioned federal documents and what our plans are this year already. Uh, we have had a long-standing plan to find ways to allow the membership to provide more active input on the development process for Hathi Trust. So how, in other words, you know, what features do we add to the access mechanisms? Uh, it's not so much like, will we fix this bug or that bug, but really at a larger scale, how can we improve the infrastructure? <coughs> so there was a proposal that came forth from the membership several years ago uh, asking you know, for this process to be put in place. And what with one thing and another, leadership transitions and so forth, we haven't really been able to find that very clearly. But it's the plan is to have a process in place by the end of the year for people to provide more input on that. I mentioned that we're continuing to do copyright review. We're looking at future projects we might do at scale, including foreign language uh, projects, non-English projects. And then the last thing I'll say is we do have some improvements to the print disability services <coughs> planned and forthcoming, which actually may be announced in the next couple of weeks. So. All right, the last thing here is just something about my own philosophy and, and organizing running Hathi Trust, and that is that working with you all to be sure that we're meeting the needs that you have uh, is, is probably my most important job. It's the thing that I, I, I really take very seriously is knowing what's important to you and finding ways to support you more, more, um, more strategically. But also, there's just way too much going on in library land for us to do everything. Uh, ourselves in Hathi Trust or to try to duplicate effort. Right? I was at a meeting last week where we talked a lot about uh, in the shared print world, how can we cooperate and collaborate better? Um, and their Center for Research Libraries heavily involved in serials but not monographs, us monographs, not serials. Uh, so doing things at large scale is still important to us. It's, you know, we can't make a big impact. With a, we have a very small staff, right? So we try to do things that have a big impact, large scale with a small number of people. But we have to work with you all and work with all kinds of other organizations, including groups that are sometimes a little bit antagonistic to what we're doing in the publishing and, and author community as well. Uh, we take that, I mean, I take that very seriously. If we can find good ways to work with people, we will. So last slide, just a whole bunch of links. Again, don't bother to write these down right now. Just, uh, you'll get this later on, but some ways you can keep in touch. Uh, you can write me if you have a question about anything. You can always write me, furlough at hatitrust.org. Uh, but the way that we tend to best track inquiries, and certainly the way I best track inquiries, is if they come through this email address at the top, feedback at issues.hatitrust.org. Um, if you write to that link, it's quite possible you'll get a response from Dan uh, at some point, depending upon the day of the week. Uh, so uh, that's, that's, the, that's the key place for us to, to get feedback and to track uh, responses. Um, and I'll just stop there and take time for questions. We do have about 15 minutes, or 10, 15 minutes it looks like. So. All right, and I have a microphone, and I need to turn this on and pass it back. Well, thank you for the talk. Um, 
I must say I haven't checked lately, but around last year I used to hear um, <coughs> from the community about your preservation, that mm -hmm. the architecture, the methodology is a little bit opaque. Mm -hmm. And when I checked, also I found it to be that way. And that in your opaque. talk, oh, you know, there isn't much known about it. Mm -hmm. And in your talk, you said so much. You you did you do say that you're a preservation mm -hmm. uh, entity, but you said almost nothing about it. Yeah. So if you can, you know, yeah. explain we'll a talk bit. about the infrastructure. Anything you can shed yeah. light on. Sure. So um, our infrastructure is. Um, uh, what did I say about that? I can do a quick moment here. So our preservation infrastructure is really based on um, you know looking forward long term, and it's also focused on trying to simplify as much as possible the kinds of materials we are going to make commitments to preserve. Right? So we have fairly narrow specs for what we will accept into the repository at this time. Um, they need, and material has to meet those specs so we can make a commitment to then ongoing mi format migration for that. So typically images are stored as JPEG 2000 and then there are data files behind that including METS files that wrap up those images along with OCR text and, uh, and, and so forth. So we make an ongoing commitment to preserving those formats <laughs> going forward. We don't, we don't currently accept, for example, PDFs as a preservation format because they're just too difficult and too many different things you can throw into them. Uh, the, uh, the other parts of the infrastructure are um, fairly, it's, I mean, a lot of it's fairly common sense. Right, so there's a, there's a pretty simplified mechanism of file storage. It's not based on an open access repository service like Fedora or DSpace. It was actually created for the purpose of Hathi Trust, primarily because there was just nothing else that could scale to the size that we were looking to scale to at the time. Uh, so most of the code then is written in, uh, in uh, Python, uh, with a little bit in Perl as well, using other open source components for, for access purposes. The biggest part of our preservation infrastructure, though, besides the you know ensuring that there is a you know strict strict format material uh, enhancements and commitments to preserve, is ensuring the organizational sustainability of this. Because even though I, you know technology is key to digital preservation, organizational sustainability is even more important. Because if that organization is not there to make the commitment going forward, then there is not a um, you know there's not really anything behind that, right? Uh, so there is a fair amount of information about the infrastructure on the site, but it is quite buried. There's when we did our uh, trusted uh, digital repository audit and certification with CRL in 2011, uh, a lot of documentation was drafted out of that. And in fact, we have not changed the infrastructure significantly since then, other than to add uh, some more storage and more uh, server components to it. So I don't know if that helps. Um, uh, it is. It is. You know, I think the key thing I would say is it's a little bit different from other preservation repositories simply because it is not, a lot of folks will talk about, you know, looking at it in terms of is it Fedora's infrastructure or not. It's really kind of a, a specialized infrastructure developed for that purpose. So. <coughs> yes, sir. Uh, we have the microphone and then you had a question too, sir. Can I uh, yeah. still first and I'll come back to <coughs> Is this on? Yeah. yeah. Actually, I have several questions, but let me start with two. First, observed. All yes, too frequently, one can find a digital copy that either lacks some pages mm -hmm. because the, micro the, the digitizing was done poorly, mm -hmm. or the item that was digitized was in some way defective because, for example, it contains underlining by readers, mm -hmm. and another copy would have been better. Is there, do you have any comments on this? And second, you mentioned the matter of authors occasionally indicating that they would be happy to have open, uh, have their publications uh, made available to people even though the copyright has not yet uh, expired. Have you made any effort to try to publicize this so that authors who have copyright on publications could contact Hathi Trust and make their publications available in that way. Okay. Thanks, so two questions. First, uh, what are we doing with quality and, and uh, broadly summarized? And second, what are we doing to publicize uh, the ability to license materials in Hathi Trust? So going to the first one, yeah, I will acknowledge, right? You go into Hathi Trust, you go into mass digitization projects, you're going to find examples of works 
that uh, items that perhaps were scanned poorly uh, or defective in some way, right? I mean, it's well known that when Google started its scanning project, the project was fairly limited in what they would scan. Uh, they could not scan large format items, right? And they did not take the time to pull out foldouts, right? So if there's a if there's a foldout map, and this is true especially in federal documents, uh, then uh, that item might not be there. The work is incomplete. Um, some of the research we've shown we've done shows that there is an awful lot. Sometimes it's an artifact of scanning, but there's an awful, I won't say it's as consistent. But defective a defective copy is not uncommon. Like a missing page in an item is, is not uncommon. So uh, it's a huge issue for us, right? We have a pretty strong commitment to quality, but uh, you know you recognize that when you have 14 million items and most of that's been scanned at scale, you're going to run into this problem at scale as well. So we have had some, re early years we did some research into the prevalence of this problem. And if you know Paul Conway in the library school at University of Michigan, he published a couple of papers just about this, about the prevalence of error and catastrophic error in Hathi Trust. Uh, we have had in the last year or so an ad hoc group working on these quality questions, looking at what we can do to first even disclose to individual users what we know about the quality of the work. Uh, so that goes a long way towards you know, being up front. If we know this item has a missing foldout, can we, is there something we can do with the metadata to disclose that? We've had in place for several years a process to gradually, but you know, not, not nearly as much as I would like, replace or rather fix items where there are known quality problems. So we do this not, by, uh, not in a systematic way of us all looking through the books and looking for errors, but to instead rely on user reports. So when someone writes to feedback at issues.hattytrust.org and says, hey, this is missing a page, or I think it's, you know, this should have this, or this page is askew, or it's blurry, or what have you, um, then that, we, that initiates a process for us to go check the volume, see if we can identify a library that has, that scanned, the, or we can talk to the library that had the copy scanned, and see if we can get that item rescanned, if it's just the missing page. Uh, and then there's a whole process that we can do with Google to get that reinserted and added back into the repository. So we've been able to do that with a few thousand items. That's really small relative to the hundreds of thousands or millions of items that we, millions of items we have in Hockey Trust. Uh, and I acknowledge it's not as much as I would like, uh, but it is one step that we can take right now. Some of the works we're, some of the projects we're looking at right now is whether we can do some more automated um, uh, process of, uh, I don't want to say assuming, but what's the word I'm looking for, uh, predicting possible problems in works and see if we can then target those works for correction over time. But I have to say, it's going to be a very long-term process. There's no doubt about that. And, and fortunately, I'm in it for the long haul, too. So, um, Publicizing license material or licensing. That is a great question, and uh, it's one of the reasons I always mention it when I come to a library, because I want people to know about it so they can talk to their faculty about it or their students, or anybody. Uh, we are not, we're such a small staff, I didn't mention this earlier, there's really only about 10 FTE on staff right now, so we don't have a lot of time to go out and do marketing of that kind of work. We have been working with a group called the Authors Alliance. I don't know if you're familiar with them. It's led by a woman named Pam Samuelson, at, who's an attorney at University of California, Berkeley. This is not the Authors Guild, this is the Authors Alliance. It's a difference. Uh, the Authors Alliance uh, has taken upon itself to publicize to authors, especially academic authors, various rights they have to have copyright reverted back to them uh, and to open materials. And I've been working with them on uh, how they can help us do outreach on just that issue to, to authors. Um, so that's, that's a step. Um, it's not as much as I would like. And I think if we, once we are fully staffed in the next few weeks, I'm actually going to look at what kind of promotional campaigns we can do around that. So thank you for the questions. Yeah, we've got my over time, but uh, but let me see if I can can slip at least a short version in. I really like the idea of working with government documents because it seems like it sort of fits the open access side of the mission really well. But as you think about that, you run you have to figure out where to draw a line, right? So there are the things that are are uh, published by the government printing office. There's gray literature from DTIC and NASA and you know technical reports all over the place from the 60s and 70s and 80s. Um, and then you go further, there's FOIA released stuff, there's declassified documents, there's the entire holdings of the National Archives. Right. It stops at some point. Can you talk about where it stops now in your present thinking 
and what your thinking is about where it might stop in the future, if that's any different. Just to help us start this project and scope it, uh, we're focusing on mostly on materials that you would find in research libraries, right? So that could be FDLP materials, could be GPO distributed, but it quite possibly might not be as well, because it could be technical reports that were distributed you know, in other ways. Um, and we have worked with TRAIL, which I cannot remember the acronym, but their fo big focus has been on digitizing technical reports um, uh, and adding those materials to, to Hanty Trust. Uh, so first boundary would be what we're, we're going to find in research library collections, but you know, if there's a great opportunity for a library collection that's outside that has a whole bunch of stuff that could get scanned, that's, you know, we'll go there too. Second, uh, immediate, I won't say hard boundary, but dotted line anyway, is around post-1976 materials primarily because that's where we think we'll have the best opportunity of identifying material because the cataloging is better in that respect. Uh, and then the third boundary, which is a little less dotted at this point, is um, text, right? So yes, there's an awful lot of stuff that was distributed on CDs or uh, in digital form, um, maybe in microfiche, but we're gonna be focusing primarily on textual printed materials first um, with if we have the opportunity to scan from other formats like microfiche or film and if it can be done affordably we would do so but the real focus is going to be on those kinds of areas first just to get started if you look at the, the way we describe the federal documents registry there is no boundary right it's like you know anything produced at federal expense going back to the origins of the republic um, which hey good luck to us right um, so <laughs> uh, the other thing I'd say is we're probably going to focus most on what at least initially on what is not already available, right? So not to say that the serial set um, wouldn't be great to have the serial set available in public access form, but uh, at least immediately we won't go there because more of that is probably licensed. And that's my guess anyway. Thanks. Does that help? Yep. I don't know how long we have the room. It's a little bit after 11, so I'm happy to keep talking though. So I noticed that uh, Wikipedia was sort of the sleeper slash dark horse in the traffic sources list. And I was wondering um, if that's the result of some kind of dedicated outreach or a program, and if um, talk a little bit about what kinds of use that you know of you're seeing. Uh, yeah, thanks. The question was then uh, how is Wikipedia involved? I didn't. You're right. I didn't mention them, even though they were fairly high. Uh, it has not been through any kind of concerted campaign from us to add items to Wikipedia. Um, I think it has been a byproduct of um, first, you know, really dedicated people who like to edit Wikipedia and looking for primary source material that they can link to. Um, I think also when, uh, uh, when Wikipedia has done projects with uh, like edit-a-thons, I think a lot of those have been hosted in libraries and higher education institutions and they've been focused on bringing their material into that. Um, I have thought about um, you know, trying to get a, uh, whether the, what, what they call Wikipedia in residence, a kind of a program of having someone dedicated to working with us for a year to look at how we can take greater advantage of that. Um, it just hasn't gotten to my, to my top of my list yet, but that's, that is something I would love to see done. And so if you have, if you edit, <laughs> you want to add primary source materials, that'd be great. Um, but it's not something I've been able to kind of make a primary campaign for right yet. Hi, um, so what is the status of uh, Google book materials that are not currently in Healthy Trust? Because I see that lo lots of them are already in Healthy Trust, but some of them, I, we, particularly, we are not too, choosing them to be digitized because we assume that at some point it will be open. Mm -hmm. are, are those currently being ingested or it was kind of a once in a lifetime? So. Um, Status, the question is about what's in HathiTrust and what's in Google and the relationship between the two more broadly. So, I mean, I will say that HathiTrust is not a perfect representation of what's in Google Books, right? Google has scanned many more items than we actually have in HathiTrust. When material, when you don't, when you find it in Google Books but not in HathiTrust, there's a number of different possible reasons. Uh, one is that it's not, a, it's a member, it's a scanned by a library that is not a member of HathiTrust and has not you know, chosen to join. So, any European libraries, um, like uh, Oxford, British Library, uh, KB in the Netherlands. They have been partners with Google, but they have not added material to Hunting Trust yet. Um, uh, there are a handful, there's a couple of member libraries that had Google scanning projects underway, but um, according to their contract, could not receive copies of the end copyright material. Uh, actually, the CI schools had this contract originally. 
as well. And the reason for that was risk of, risk aversion uh, because Google was being sued and you know, there was like risk, we take the copyright and we're gonna get sued too. So, uh, but since the uh, Hathi Trust Authors Guild case was uh, finished up and now I think since the Google Authors Guild case is done uh, at last, thank you yesterday, uh, <laughs> then, uh, then uh, I believe we'll see more of that material, the escrow material coming in. In fact, I know of two big uh, collections that are planning to release into Hathi Trust this year. Um, and then there's a couple of other, um, there's a few instances where I think under Google's don't quote me on this, even though this is being recorded and I heard this is going on YouTube. Uh, certain publishers have the ability to opt out with Google, so they can, you know, that's under their terms, so they can opt out of Google, either including the books in Hobby Trust or releasing uh, to, to libraries as well. So, um, my ambition I and mean, my goal is to get much more of that stuff in, right? And then I think a number of different libraries have a goal of including material in their scanning workflows that Google rejected. So, Michigan has done that. Um, I was talking with someone else last week that was planning to do some of that as well, especially as we start looking at these federal documents in print uh, archiving projects. Does that help? Okay. Um, okay. Actually, the mic here, and then we'll take it back up there. Um, I'm generally interested in hearing more about the copyright review mm -hmm. process, uh, but my specific question would be that upon completion of copyright review, how is uh, is information uh, about how the item was determined to be in the public domain or whatever made available to users of Hathi Trust and how? Uh, yeah, that, uh, so briefly the process is, uh, I will say, is it, is it, it's kind of a double, I won't say double blind, but it's a double review. So two different individuals undertake the review of an item, look into the copyright status, and if they come to agreement, then we will go with what they determine. If they disagree, then an expert reviewer will adjudicate. Um, and a lot of times, it's not a matter of saying this is either in copyright or out of copyright, but it's undetermined. Right? We just don't have, a, we don't have enough certainty to know, and in those cases, we just don't open them. And we mark them undetermined for another day. Uh, we do not do the best job of disclosing all of that research to the public right now. Um, if inside the CRMS system, there are, there's some notes that people take, you know, like saying, okay, check this, or this was confusing, or, you know, next reviewer, check this. Uh, and that stuff, it's not formatted or structured in such a way to be really useful for the most part. Uh, we do have a pretty extensive um, list of rights codes <coughs> and a pretty extensive list of reason codes that go along with that. Uh, as well, and uh, those 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 flags are actually only identifiable right now, or findable right now through our inventory files. Um, not the best, honestly. And so one of the one of the groups I flashed on the screen that is not I didn't describe is the metadata use and strategy group, um, and they're what they're working on right now are uh, a number of different policies that would look at how we can better share metadata or even look at what our corrections policy ought to be. Uh, and I think from that, we can begin to make some more strategic um, event, uh, um, strategic use of the metadata there and more disclosure of it. Um, you know, we're not world cats, so it's not a matter of like disclosing, you know, we don't need to do, a, you know, try to replicate that, but we actually do have accumulated a fair amount of metadata about these items that don't exist anywhere else, and we need to make that more useful. My next set of questions are interrelated. Okay. You mentioned, for example, the matter of Yiddish. Mm -hmm. You also pointed out that there are a few libraries in Canada that have members. What interaction <coughs> might you have, for example, with the National Yiddish Center in Amherst, Massachusetts, which has been collecting for years Yiddish language publications and trying to preserve them? What can you be doing, perhaps in the future, with the National Library of Canada? which presumably has a lot of material that would be very useful. My second related question, what about private collections of it, that individuals have that are not, that, that have materials that are not duplicated in research libraries, but would be very appropriate for research libraries? Have you taken that into account on a long-term basis? Thanks. Uh, so I'll take the first, the second one first there. Uh, we have not done a lot with private donors. Um, it's, it's kind of beyond the scope of what we have said we were out to do. Our primary collecting focus has been what, I mean, when people ask me, what is, what is Hathi Trust digitizing? I always say our members are digitizing. 
and I can't tell you because I, you know, I don't have like all their lists in front of me. Uh, but really, it's the members who make the choices about what are digitized. Even Google schools um, have leeway in identifying materials that would go or not go to Google and have some influence in, in, in that. Uh, so first and foremost, what we look for are what the libraries value and what they can make available. I, you know, right now, I can't imagine an easy process for us to work with a private library, or and by private, I mean an individual's personal library, okay, to, um, to digitize a collection unless a library is working with that, with that individual directly. Um, and it's not something I think we can easily, you know, explain <coughs> right, right now, just to be honest. But it's, I, it's a great point because there's an awful lot of cool stuff in those, in those private collections. Um, smaller independent research libraries, those are examples of the kinds of libraries that we have had some, um, some projects with digitizing. They, they digitize and we add it to the collection. The National Yiddish Center, actually, uh, we've had in the past a conversation about them adding materials to Optitrust. Uh, and uh, the, uh, it's actually a conversation that we just need to kind of restart because um, uh, we, we actually had a very good conversation about what we could do with that. Um, it just had to get paused for a little while on our side, and so that's actually been uh, part of the plan all along. It's, uh, right now, last time I looked, we don't have a large number of Yiddish language materials. I want to say it's in the four digits, um, but I know uh, for, for those schools and for those libraries and those researchers who look for that, that's, it's important because it's just so hard to find that in, in any other way, right? And most of that could be open, or much of it could be. And the National Library of Canada? National Library of Canada, thank you. Um, haven't had a conversation with them, be honest. We've been focused more on working with uh, the research libraries in Canada that are uh, already well-known and uh, well-known partners with U.S. libraries, like the four I mentioned, and maybe Toronto and a few others. Uh, it's not to say we wouldn't work with the National Library of Canada. We just haven't had it had that conversation yet. Uh, Library of Congress is a member of Hathi Trust. Uh, whether that's a national library or not is up for debate sometimes, uh, but that's, uh, that's the closest example I have of that, so. Other questions? One more here. In, in the, oops, oh, in the long run, let's say over the next three to five years, what efforts do you think will be made to internationalize you mentioned the matter, for example, of Oxford. What about library, academic research libraries and national libraries beyond that? You did refer to Keio University Library, but what about French and German libraries? What about Russian libraries? What about libraries in the third world where there is the potential <coughs> of destruction and loss of materials, either because of climate or because of war and revolution? Right. And you think, for example, just as one case, what has happened in uh, Central Africa, mm -hmm. in Mali, with the Islamic documents there, the Islamic manuscripts there? Um, all great questions. And um, so I can say that as far as, when, let's start with internationalizing. You mentioned first European countries there. Uh, when, when you look at what Hathi Trust does, I started out by saying, okay, we're a digital library. There's a bunch of stuff in it. You can access it. Uh, that's cool. But more importantly, we're a collective of libraries that are working together to solve problems together. And so part of the question that I have, and I've had when I went to the UK last year just to find out what was going on there, was what, what are y'all working on together, right? And is that something that Hathi Trust can help support, right? Or is that something that can help us if you're working, you know, and, and exploring that area of mutual potential collaboration there. Uh, and I think that's something that's got to be done on a nation-by-nation -nation <laughs> basis because I think the cultures in each country are different, the library cultures are different, the legal structures are different. Um, and so while I'm not uh, uninterested in exploring international members, uh, I think the, the, the decision factors are going to be different for, for libraries in those countries. Um, you know, if, uh, if a country is not doing a lot of digitizing and doesn't have capacity, they're probably not going to get out of it, right, for example. Um, but there are examples where that has, that has been done. Um, on the broader picture of at-risk materials and, and uh, collections in, uh, you know, say, non-European countries, yeah, that, I, you know, I wish I had a solution for that, right? I mean, I am not, uh, I'm not unconcerned about that, but I also have to draw some boundaries around what we will tackle in order to be able to be effective at what we do. 
Um, I do know that that particular set of issues is something of great concern to the Council of Library and Information Resources, uh, CLEAR, which is led by Chuck Henry, who's given a couple of talks about this, but I, I'm sorry that I cannot recall the specifics of what programs they have underway on that. Well, thank you, Mike. Would you? Thank uh, you.